Okay, so we'll talk a little bit about the uh, history of computers and computer science, and uh, this is only a couple pages in the uh, textbook, uh, but I'll add a little bit more information as to what I know and uh, hopefully fill in some uh, details. Uh, this could be an entire course in and of itself, so uh, we'll keep this uh, pretty brief uh, since we're just doing an intro to computer science course. So we can start with the uh, precursors, and probably the first precursors were our uh, fingers and toes of uh, 40 things that we share. Uh, you know, these were used uh, in order to uh, count, and uh, if you want to look it up, the uh, Babylonians actually had a very cool way of counting all the way up to 60 uh, using their fingers and toes and the uh, knuckles. Uh, from there, we uh, probably progressed to uh, counting boards, uh, putting stones onto uh, boards or onto uh, rocks in order to uh, count up how many different items that we had. Uh, the next one was probably the abacus, uh, which uh, if you, uh, you may still see them in uh, parts of like Hong Kong where uh, people are very quick with them. And in fact, you can actually take a cubed root with an abacus. Uh, there's some pretty cool algorithms and people who are fast with these are actually faster than uh, people who use uh, electronic calculators. Another one was the Antikythera mechanism, which is one that we found in a shipwreck off of uh, Greece. And it was a computational uh, and navigational device. Uh, we still don't know all the uh, details of that one, but uh, that one was created in antiquity. Uh, from there, uh, we progressed to the uh, slide rule, which was invented by Napier uh, to help with uh, logarithms and in particular Napier's bones. And then the uh, Pascaline, which was a uh, calculator invented by Blaise Pascal in 1672. Uh, the probably the first programmable device was something called the Jacquard Loom, and it was in 1801. And what it did was it had punch cards that allowed you to uh, create the intricate patterns uh, automatically using those uh, punch cards. So it no longer took the uh, designer to create those intricate patterns. You could actually program the Loom to uh, make those patterns. And you may have seen uh, Jacquard polos uh, from time to time. Uh, that's still named after uh, Jacquard, who invented that loom. Um, the difference engine uh, was created by uh, Babbage, uh, and that was in 1822. Uh, he also had plans for an analytical engine, which would be a more general purpose computer. And the uh, person who did most of the programming with the uh, difference engine was a woman by the name of Ada Lovelace, who's uh, generally acknowledged as the uh, world's first computer programmer. Uh, there is an entirely interesting story about Babbage, and if you go to the uh, Computer History Museum in San Jose, you can actually see a model of the uh, difference engine that was uh, built and is actually operational. And then in 1890, uh, the idea of punch cards uh, came about again uh, with the 1890 census by a man by the name of Herman Hollerith. The uh, 1880 census, I think, had taken eight years to uh, complete. And during the 1880s to 1890s, there was a large amount of immigration into the United States, and the population nearly doubled. And if you think about it, then it would have probably taken close to 16 years to complete that census, uh, but we only have 10 years in between censuses. So uh, Hollerith came up with the idea of encoding the information on punch cards and then having a uh, tabulator uh, perform the uh, calculations as to how many people were living in the country and what data we were collecting on them at the uh, time. Uh, Hollerith went on to found a uh, company in upstate New York that uh, later became IBM. So a uh, fairly uh, famous uh, precursor and that led IBM into uh, getting into uh, computers since that was their uh, founding. Uh, here's a picture of the difference engine. I think that one's from the uh, Computer History Museum. Uh, it had the crank, and you could actually uh, crank it and program it to uh, make those calculations between uh, systems of equations. This is the edge card loom. Uh, you can see the uh, punched uh, sheet and the cards, and uh, it would allow the uh, person operating it to uh, weave uh, fairly intricate patterns into the uh, fabric. Uh, the picture on the right are Luddites. Uh, Luddites were people who were against uh, technology and wanted to smash uh, technology. Uh, you may hear the term neo-Luddite uh, from time to time, uh, so it's uh, still around. And there's the Hollerus machine. Um, 
including the uh, tabulator, which uh, came later. And then things really took off during World War II. Uh, the Mark I was, I believe, at Harvard. It was electromechanical. Uh, the ENIAC was the United States uh, war effort, and it was designed to calculate artillery shell trajectories. And basically, before that, they had a job which was known as a computer. So your job could be a computer, and you would make these uh, handbooks for people on the field to know uh, at what angle uh, and velocity to fire artillery shells in order to hit particular targets. The ENIAC was designed to automate that. Uh, there was also a precursor um, to the ENIAC, which was the ABC or Antonasov Berry computer, and uh, that was uh, primarily designed by uh, Antonasov. Uh, that one's the subject of a uh, famous case. Uh, I think it's Honeywell versus Sperry Rand, um, where uh, the inventors of the ENIAC, Eckert and Mockley, attempted to patent the ENIAC so that no one would have the ability to make an electronic computer for uh, 20 years. But they had taken a large part of the design from the Antonasov Berry computer. And so the court ruled that uh, this was not, in fact, a patentable device because uh, there wasn't enough new in the ENIAC to uh, patent the entire concept of an electronic computer. And that was really important because uh, it allowed us, uh, you know, 20 years for different people to develop different types of computers. Uh, another World War II effort was the uh, Colossus, which was electromechanical. And that one was created by the British for uh, code breaking. Alan Turing was uh, one of the uh, principals, and we'll hear a lot more about Turing uh, as we go through uh, computer science. And of course, Germany actually had a uh, development of a computer underway. Uh, it was the Z1, and it was uh, led by a guy by the name of Konrad Zuse. But uh, Hitler didn't think there was much value in having a computer, so it pretty much sat in Zuse's uh, Berlin apartment and he had to complete the uh, work after the war and was able to successfully do so. So that's uh, something great uh, for Zusa. So there's the uh, Mark I. Um, notice it had a communications device and a uh, clock uh, application uh, built into it, but uh, that's a pretty big electromechanical computer. There's the Antonasov Berry uh, computer. Uh, the ENIAC, and a uh, picture there is Art Burks. I actually had Art Burks uh, for a class uh, when I was an undergraduate, so that's kind of dating how old I am, uh, but he was the inventor of the multiplier and the principal programmer on the ENIAC. And there's the uh, Colossus, which again was electromechanical and then was designed for code breaking by the uh, British in World War II. And there's uh, Zeus's Z1 uh, that was, again, stored in his uh, Berlin apartment. Uh, you can see the uh, bicycle hanging on the uh, wall, so he could go out and uh, bicycle and run errands. Uh, but, yeah, he built most of it in his uh, apartment. I believe uh, there was some real severe damage to it during the uh, bombing of uh, Berlin. Uh, Post-World War II, uh, John von Neumann came up with the idea of the stored program computer. So for things like the ENIAC or the Colossus, uh, what you had was you had kind of a requirement that they would do exactly what you specified them to do. They weren't uh, general purpose. And if you wanted the ENIAC to do something slightly different, you had to rewire the entire thing. So you know, making uh, programs on these were uh, really difficult. Von Neumann came up with the idea of storing the program within the computer and then being able to run multiple different types of programs on the computer. He also came up with von Neumann architecture that we'll see in the next slide. Uh, you also saw vast commercializations of machines, uh, you know, from the government being the only uh, entity that had computers to moving them into research, uh, to business, and uh, finally to uh, individuals, which came about in the uh, 1970s and 1980s, which is kind of where I came in. So the von Neumann architecture, this was another one of John von Neumann's uh, contributions, uh, was with the design of the machine, there were four major subsystems, the uh, memory, um, the input-output, the arithmetic logic unit that did the computations, and the control unit that kind of acted as the brain. Nowadays, we usually combine the control unit and the ALU into the CPU or central processing unit. 
And von Neumann also came up with this uh, fetch, decode, and execute uh, cycle. And you'll see that in 266 and uh, 410. You fetch the instruction, decode what it is that instruction means, and then uh, go about the series of steps in order to execute that instruction. And there are different ways of doing that, different ways of uh, making it uh, parallel. So, you know, we've had quite a uh, development of the computer just, you know, in a uh, less than a hundred years, uh, we went from um, you know electromechanical uh, and uh, wiring and vacuum tubes in the uh, 1940s and 1950s to uh, transistors, which were invented by uh, Shockley in the early 1960s, which was the solid state uh, electronics that uh, you know we see a lot today. Uh, programming uh, languages um, developed in the early 1960s, uh, so you didn't have to write things necessarily in uh, machine code. You could write them in assembler or third generation languages such as C and C++ that uh, we're going to use for this class. Uh, integrated circuits uh, appeared in around 1965. And then uh, microcomputers, uh, which were the uh, ones that you could have at home in the late 1970s, early 1980s. And the uh, fifth generation, um, you know, that's a debate as to uh, what that constitutes. Um, but, you know, highly parallel and massively parallel uh, computation uh, would be uh, one of the hallmarks of that. So that's a very, very brief history of uh, computer science and computers. And uh, there's a heck of a lot more to it. Uh, I find it to be a really interesting aspect of the field. And uh, hopefully you do too. And if you want to investigate more on that, I can uh, point you to some resources. Uh, thanks so much for listening.